So we're going to continue our study with Daniel 2. We're looking at the statue and we so to speak arrived at the feet where I suggested, can you guys hear me? Is that fine? Okay, then we'll just ignore the rain. Um, I suggested that the feet are the ten horns we find in Daniel 10 or the ten toes. The ten European tribes in which uh, Rome, pagan Rome, was broken up in. We had seen that um, the feet composed a metal from a previous part of the, the statue, and that was iron. And we knew that iron was pagan Rome. So I suggest that when we see iron in the feet, that Rome continues. Rome continues till today. However, we read from um, thoughts on Daniel and Revelation from Uriah Smith that. Uh, the kings can change their territory, their names, uh, there might be sometimes few more, sometimes less. So I suggest today it's not called Rome anymore, Western Rome, um, but it has different names, or it had different names throughout history. Um, we saw the Myra Clay is the Catholic Church, and yesterday we started looking a little bit on how the Catholic Church came into play. We looked at this yesterday, where I said that after the apostles had died, three centers were created for uh, Christians, or Christ where Christ a lot of Christians were coming together. This was in Rome, in Alexandria, and in Antioch. And uh, in Rome as well, it's as in, in Alexandria. Can you still hear me? <laughs> okay. Uh, I can barely hear myself. <laughs> Um, in Rome and Alexandria, they started to apostatize. The Alexandrians, they were mingling paganism with uh, Christianity. That's how they went into apostasy. And Rome was mingling also Christianity with paganism. However, they were um, going for the traditions and the customs. And they were uh, going, they were have, starting to having a form of Christianity like the monks have it. Like they were fasting a lot, they were inflicting pain to themselves, they were supporting pilgrimages and all these things. That's what the Christians in Rome started to do. As well as they were reaching out um, very often to the emperor of Rome in order to sustain their position among Christians that they would be the that they would fill the primary place as the, the descendants or the, the primary church of Christians. So these two went into apostasy and Antioch, um, this is just a short summary of how the church sort of continued after the disciples. However, in Antioch, um, the Christians there preserved the, the true faith, the true gospel of the disciples and Rome and Alexandria, they were both united against Antioch, those Christians in Antioch. And they were uh, saying that Antioch, those people are not even Christians. They were disfellowshipping them. So that's why I draw this line here. So we see Rome and Alexandria, they apostatize. Antioch, they have the true faith. They're spreading this faith all over Europe. You have uh, here in uh, Northern Italy as well as here in France and in the UK and other places, that's where uh, big centers of Christianity were created um, due to the effort of the brethren in Antioch. Rome, however, I put a little crown on there because yesterday I explained they put the elbows out um, to be this primary church and they succeeded with doing this one by one. And this is where how the man of sin was created and it slowly became power. Uh, we talked a little bit yesterday also about this, uh, this um, rock one more time here and we did an application in Matthew 16. Do you remember Peter? Peter where Ellen White says he is a loose rock and we saw that Christ is the foundation, he is the true rock and on this foundation he's going to build his church and to build the church you need stones, bricks, right? And Peter is one loose stone. And I suggested that this stone um, is also represented by Peter, which Christ takes to throw at this image. Christ is going to take this little stone 
and he's going to throw it to destroy the image. Do we have a story like that um, in the Bible? Where somebody uses a stone to destroy someone. It's David, right? David. Can David represent Christ? Yes. And he also took a stone and he struck the enemy, right? And killed him. Yet though not at the feet, but at the head. Okay, so I suggested that the stone is the Seventh-day Adventist church, the remnant church. Uh, but when you look closely, you know that uh, the Adventist church in its structure went into apostasy, went into captivity. And the Lord currently, since 30 years, is um, uh, purifying Adventism. And it's the 144,000, the pure church, the church triumphant, who actually will be, will be this tool in the Lord's hand to defeat Satan and his kingdom over here. Okay, um, before we continue, I want to remind us, let's go to page 52. There we talked a little bit about the eagle, if you remember. And I had three eagles on there. What was the eagle standing for? Does somebody remember? Jupiter? So there was a main god, Jupiter, and he has a messenger. And who's that messenger? That was the eagle, right? The eagle was considered as the messenger of the main god, Jupiter. So we said this could refer to a counterfeit Holy Spirit. However, we read also on the second paragraph on page 52, the last sentence, during the reign of Eastern Roman Emperor Isaac Komnenos, the single-headed eagle was modified to, to double-headed to symbolize the empire's dominions over East and West. What had happened to Rome? So Rome, as we said yesterday, ruled the world. They ruled large, large portions of Europe, all this portion here, as well as Italy, Northern Africa, and big portions of the UK and the Middle East. Um, Rome the, was ruling the world. However, in 395, Rome do, was divided into West and East. And somebody came yesterday and asked me why was this division? And I said, that's a good question. So I went and um, looked again at the reason. And this division was in, let me see, uh, 395 AD, and this division, <coughs> excuse me, occurred under the rulership of the Roman Empire Di Di Diocletian. Sorry for my poor pronunciation. However, um, he divided Rome because uh, Rome became so big in its territory that he decided it was, to be, was best to divide the country um, in order to maintain it better. So that's why Rome was then divided into west and east. Um, reason being as well is because in that time period, Rome was all, it was time for Rome to fall. And other nations would come at its borders and um, cause problems. And the Romans had trouble since their territory was so big, the borders were really big. And there were many nations around these borders. So in order to handle that, they found it best to divide between West and East so they could handle this better. And by the way, this is not the first time that Rome was divided. Uh, previous to the time period of Constantine the Great, Rome was already divided once into four um, territories. However, it was Constantine the Great who united Rome actually again. It's a very interesting history, but I just sh recently started looking into this history, so I won't be dealing with, with it here yet. Okay, so Rome is divided in west and east, and we have the eagle, which is demonstrating Roman dominion. The Roman um, the eagle was very important for the Romans. Uh, it was a military sign. It uh, was a sign for dominion over the Roman Empire. And later on you have the double-headed eagle, which signifies the, the, the uh, supremacy over west and east. And then I suggested yesterday to you that when you go through history, 
the last 1,500 years, every nation who was wearing this crown of Rome, of Rome, how it continues, um, had in that time period the eagle as their representation. And um, I suggest, I said it was, uh, go to page 51. You have there um, these three kingdoms. And the first one says the Holy Roman Empire of German nations. And there we saw an eagle which had two heads. The dominion over west and east. And also Napoleon, when he was wearing the crown, he had an eagle as his symbol. And when the kingdom was given to Austria, they had an eagle as well as Germany, or today it's America who have the eagle as their, um, their um, symbol. And I su suggested yesterday that also Russia have an eagle as their um, symbol, but this is a two-headed eagle. So Russia is also striving for the dominion over west and east. Let's look a little bit closer at the eagle from the United States. And you all should be very familiar with what those symbols in your flag or in your bold eagle means. But what does this eagle have in his hand? It's an olive branch, right? And arrows, right? So what does the olive branch stand for? Peace, right? And what do the arrows stand for? War. So what is this? Eagle claiming <coughs> to have power over what? Peace and war. In what direction is the eagle turning to? Where's, in what direction is he looking? It's the east. So what do you think? What should be his supreme um, goal? Peace, right? That's what he should bring. Peace. And if necessary, war. I find it though interesting because that's really the role of America at the moment. They have the power over peace and war. And we can see that when America does something, it either causes peace in the world, or if America stirs it up, as we know they will, like we see in the first verses of Daniel 11 when we do the application of the last four precedents, then there is war, right? Can we see that in the history today? And I suggest also that the olive branch stands for the lamp and the arrow stand for the dragon face of America. Okay, our goal is to understand Pope Francis' intention. The new Roman Empire, the global reach of Pope Francis. Um, I suggested yesterday that the kingdom of Rome, the crown, was always handed to a different nation. And this is actually, there is a proper term for this. And this proper term is, let me get it to you, translatio imperi. Translatio imperi is Latin and means transfer of rule. And this indicates uh, this transferring of this power to the next nation. Translato imperi, Latin for transfer of rule, is a his historiographical concept originating in the Middle Ages in which history is viewed as a linear succession of transfer of an Im imperium that invests supreme power in a singular ruler, an emperor, or sometimes even sem several emperors, the Eastern Roman, like the Eastern Roman Empire and the Western Holy Roman Empire. Um, yeah, so translatio imperi is the, the imp, imp, uh, expression, the word for what we're going to look at in the history of Europe, where this Rome, how the crown of Rome was handed to the next ruler till today. And I suggest that the crown of Rome today is in the hands of America. Okay, for this we want to go back and see again the beginnings of these um, of the Ten Kings. The beginning of this relationship of the kings and the Catholic Church. Because Anne White calls it what? What does she call the Catholic Church? A masterpiece of Satan. And it truly is a masterpiece as we consider the, 
the unique relationship the Catholic Church has with the, the kings of this earth. So let's um, turn to page 43 and we're going to read out of this book now, Truth Triumphant, the um, history of how Rome came up, how paper Rome came up. Because I suggested if we want to understand modern Rome, what do we have to do? We have to look at the beginning of pagan Rome and the beginning of papal Rome. And please don't forget that the Roman Christian Church put its elbow out in order to have this supremacy among the Christian churches. That was always the strife of Rome, to be the first. And they continue to do that. So this is uh, from Truth Triumphant, by the way, you can for free download the PDF online or you can obtain the book. Um, I always prefer books, <coughs> but some people like rather PDFs. Page 43, there it says Truth Triumphant, chapter 10. So almost all of chapter 10 is in here, but I cut some paragraphs out which were not as important. So we're going to read quite a bit of that now and comment on it. How the church was driven into the wilderness. Pan cannot, dis can Pan cannot picture how completely the face of Western Rome was changed by the Teutonic invasion sweeping from the east to the south and west. These continued for at last two centuries, ending in 508 when the papacy completed its tri triumph over the newcomers. The inhabitants of Europe were driven into the background, as was also the general use of the Latin language, while strangers and foreign tongues reigned from the Danube to the Thames. The amount of territory of the old Roman Empire was practically halved. Profound changes took place in what remained of that empire, now limited to the eastern end of the Mediterranean. Meanwhile, in Eastern Rome, there was a revival of the simpler types of Christianity. The Celtic and the Gothic people in the West also contributed to this new evangelical era. From 250 to, five, to, to about 500, the Teutonic masses poured over the provinces of Western Europe and formed ten new nations. Among these ten were the two branches of the Goths the Visigoths and the Western Goths, the, or Western Goths, and the Ostrogoths or Eastern Goths. Other invading tribes were the Franks, the Burgundians, the Vandals, the Anglo-Saxons, the Alemanni, the Huruli, and the Suevi. These were destined to become powerful nations of Western Europe. The invading hosts settled in the Roman Empire, forming, forming such kingdoms as England, France, Germany, Switzerland, Spain, Italy, Portugal. Three other kingdoms aroused from the migrations, and if they had not been conquered, the Ruli might now be ruling over central and southern Italy, the Vandals over northern Africa, and the Ostrogoths in southern Europe. For two centuries, these questions hung in the balance. Would these new nations cling to the ancient Germanic paganism? Would they become converts to Celtic Christianity? Would they fall under the dominion of the church at Rome? Is it a gripping story that reveals how they were converted, some at first to Gothic, but later all to Celtic Christianity, before they had subdued by hostile nations whose army, armies were urged on by the papacy? So Wilkinson describes here now how Western Rome actually falls. So we see the West and the East are divided, and how long is the East going to last? Remember? 1453 AD till the Islamic power would take over this territory, the East. And the West dissolves into ten nations. And that's exactly what our pioneers understood. And they put the ten kings right here. So the tribes we were just reading about, they are depicted here. And here we see three three which are being plucked up then in order for the papacy to be able to rise. So I haven't done much study yet on the tribes, um, but you have different tribes and I can tell you a few where they were. You had, for example, the Vandals, they were in northern Africa all along, and you had the, the Suevi, they were here, Portugal, Spain, here in the north. You had the Franks, which originated here, 
or you had the Saxons, which came actually from here, but then went also over uh, to the UK. You had the Lombardi, which were in North Italy, and uh, this is about it, where I know maybe it's an interesting research of where these tribes were. And this is actually where Europeans come from, and essentially this is also where Americans come from, right? <laughs> so uh, it's a good history. Okay, so Western Roman Empire dissolves into ten nations. They, um, you have Western Rome, and it just crumbles. You know when you have a cookie or a, a cracker, and then you break it, and it breaks in more pieces. That's what happened to the Western Empire. Suddenly you had ten nations, and um, they had to organize themselves. And they sort of were fighting everyone against everyone, trying to win territory for themselves. Let's continue reading. Um, here he uh, quotes now Daniel 7, verse 23 to 26. Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse from them first, and he shall subdue three kings, and he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change the time and laws, and they shall be given into his end until a time, times, and a dividing of time. But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end. So this is prophecy now. Daniel describes what is going to happen. And now we're going to see how history actually fulfills this. The chain of prophecy in Daniel 7 reveals by the means of animal symbols the succession of world events from the time of the prophetic writer until the second coming of Christ. On the head of the fourth beast of Daniel's prophecy, uh, which beast is often interpreted to be the fourth universal monarchy, the Roman Empire um, empire are seen ten horns. Commentators correctly conclude that these are the ten Germanic kingdoms which invaded, broke up, and took possession of the western part of the Roman Empire or the original territory of the fourth beast. The rise of the little horn, its growth in power, its plucking up of the three ten horns, its stunned words against God accompanied by the 1260 year persecution of the saints must now claim attention. Now he's going into uh, the history of Clovis. <clears throat> so we're, we, we saw now that Western Rome is dissolved into ten kings. Now we have to look for the crown. Who is wearing that crown? So there is a time period where um, this Western Empire is broken up. But uh, now um, we will see, as you remember, clay and iron tries to do what? They try to mingle. They, these kings, they always try to mingle, but they can't because it can't fit together. So what we will try in history, what we see in history, is that these kings, these ten tribes, which were Western Rome was breaking up, broken up in ten kingdoms, but we will see always the attempt to create one supreme ruler or one supreme tribe of these um, various tribes. And the first of those, after the Western Rome was broken up, was Clovis. And I think we already know a little bit Clovis, and he's an important figure for us to consider. Clovis was the king of the Friends, one of the pagan tribes which had previously crossed the empire's frontiers into the province of Gaul. So Gaul is essentially um, Friends. His father before him had worked devotedly with Rome's bishop. So you see, um, already the, these tribe leaders, they have already some kind of connection to Rome. Why is that? Why do tribe leaders already have connections to um, the Bishop of Rome? So the, what happened is the disciples were told to bring the gospel to the world. And everyone did that. Rome did that, Alexandria did it, Antioch did it. They all spread the gospel. And the gospel was heard pretty much everywhere in Europe. And a lot of people in some shape and form obtained the Christian faith. Um, how can I explain it? Because there's so much information and 
I need to bring it across in an easy way. Um, so, of course, Rome and Alexandria, they brought across a faith which was defiled. It was mingled with paganism. And Antioch would bring across a pure faith. And a lot of these ten tribes, which we consider as pagan, when you look closer at them, they were actually already Christians. But because they didn't have the Christian um, view of Rome, for example, they were considered pagans. And later on, they were also considered Arians. Is that the way to say it? So when you look at Arianism, um, this is the, the struggle of um, the Holy Spirit, which later on we will touch a little bit on that. And there was a section of a group of people w which truly had a uh, apostatized idea about it. However, if uh, Rome had an idea about the Trinity as well, and if you would not believe as the Romans did, you were just considered as an Aryan. Didn't matter what you were believing, you were just considered one of those people. Um, so, like, like they say, if you're not for us, you're against us, sort of. That was the attitude of Rome. Um, where was I going with that? Okay, so the pagan tribes, often they had already obtained some form of Christianity. And the reason being is that because Christianity started already way back when Daniel was in Babylon. When Daniel was in Babylon and all the Jews, they practiced their faith in Babylon. And there was a guy who has a really complicated name. I probably won't be able to find it right now. Um, but his name starts with a set. Something like sex, sacris. I might find it till tomorrow. However, he lived more or less at the time, same time period as Daniel, and he invented a cult which is called the Mitra cult. Have you ever heard of this cult? Mit Mithra? Mithra, have you heard of this? So, because of this cult, we're celebrating Christmas today. Um, because Christmas was actually a, a celebration day of that cult. However, this cult uh, when you look at the history of this cult and what, they're, what they are believing, it's very similar to Christian cult and the, the story of redemption. And this can, you can trace that back all the way to when Daniel was in Babylon. So this guy must have copied some of the Jewish faith back then. And then down through history, you have these two kingdoms. You have the false one and you have the true one. You have this false idea about Christianity, wasn't called Christianity at that time, but the true faith. And uh, the true faith, they, they, they line up. They, the history, they go contemplar <laughs> contemporary. There you go. However, so when the, when the disciples started to spread the gospel and it came to the territories, um, people who were believing in the Mitra cult, they thought that the Christian, Christian faith was an apostasy of their own faith because it was so similar. And people didn't understand it anymore which one is the right one now, the Mitra cult or the Christian cult, so to speak, it's Christian faith. So um, you had this already going on previously to the, um, the Mitra cult was already spread. Uh, before the Christian faith was spread. So then the Christians came, a lot of the people obtained the Christian faith, but uh, um, kept also some of their Mitra cult. And it's really interesting, when you look at, go to Rome, that's where the Mitra cult was um, practiced big time. And the first Christian church in Rome is actually built on a Mitra temple. You have uh, the three stories below. You go down there, you see the altar for Mitra, and uh, on top you have the Christian church. You can see very nicely there how paganism is replaced by apostate Christianity by Rome. However, so you see here that the tribe leaders, they already were familiar with some of the practices, some of the Christian faith. So they were, in some extent, already thinking of the Bishop of Rome as their spiritual leader, because there was always in every religion, there was a spiritual leader. Does that make sense? 
I'm trying to give a little bit of context, but there's so much history to understand these things. The best is if you read the story and history yourself. I can only give you here the, the input to say go and study yourself. <laughs> okay, so we're with Clovis, and Clovis, they are already, uh, already to some extent, um, know of, about the, the Christian culture or about Rome. Therefore, it's not a surprise the tribe leaders would consider Rome as their spiritual leader in some shape or form. So Clovis was the king of the friends, one of the pagan tribes which had previously crossed the empire's frontiers into the province of Gaul. His father before him had wor worked devotedly with Rome's bishops. Clovis met successfully, overthrew the feeble resistance of the empire's army. His next formidable enemy was the pagan Alemanni later to be called the Germans. He had a long and bloody battle with them in which he successfully resisted their invasion. Previous to this, he had married Clotilda, daughter of the Burgundians and a devout Catholic. Observing the power and influence of the papacy and anxious to avail himself of papal support, he professed conversion in 496 and his entire following united with him in, a tr in her adherence to Catholicism, 3,000 3, of whom were baptizing along with himself soon after his conversion. He, as, he expected the Catholic rail, as he expected, the Catholics railed around him as the only Catholic prince in the West. So there's a lot of meat in this uh, paragraph. What is happening? So. Clovis dad has already some kind of connection to the Bishop of Rome and he actually forms an alliance with the Burgundies uh, in order he enters into a marriage relationship and his wife is Catholic so therefore um, why is he profession conversion in 496 to Catholic faith why is that observing the power and influence of the papacy so what is happening? That's why I suggested keep an eye on how Rome puts its elbow out and always wants to be first. Rome is gaining influence. When you read Great Controversy chapter 3, you see how Rome constantly invented new doctrines. They are in the notes here, I put them all in. Uh, we, we, I was not going to go through them. But doctrines like the false Sabbath, um, or how sin is atoned for, or uh, the pilgrimages, and on and onward. Um, she, as a church, always invented those things in order to gain more um, power. So, and the civil authority recognizes or observes this power. And what does the civil authority want to do? They want to use this power. So, let's continue. Observing the power and influence of the papacy, and anxious to avail himself of papal support. So it's about the power and authority and the support of Rome, a person or a church who is very powerful. Um, that's why he professed conversion in the year 496. And how many people got baptized with him? 3,000. Doesn't that sound like a counterfeit Pentecost? <coughs> so, and what... Uh, by the way, he professes conversion in 496, but he doesn't get baptized till the year 508. You see that in, on page, page 52, um, there you see that he's, Clovis was baptized on Christmas Day in 508. <clears throat> so conversion in the year 496, not because he was becoming Christian in that sense, but he was observing how the Catholic Church had received power and has a big portion of influence, and he wants to use that power. He wants to use that support. Let's continue. They Teutonic, uh, and therefore, because of this, um, this conversion, the Catholic Church has now one prince, one king in the West, which are theirs. The East was all Catholic, we will see that later, um, but the Eastern Roman Empire was all Catholic already, but it was the Western Empire which needed to be also transferred to Christianity, and Clovis was the first one. That was their prince in the West. 
And do you remember, I think it was in the first presentation where I said there's this unique relationship between the uh, civil authorities and the papacy that there is like a hate-love relationship, that they hate each other but they need one another. So this is what we're going to see. The Teutonic Kingdoms, we'll continue now on page 44, the Teutonic Kingdoms which had occupied other Roman provinces as well as France were either continuing in their idolatry or were converted to Christianity as taught by Ulfilas. Ulfilas was a, a, a true Christian who was spreading the gospel. They're usually catalogued as Arians, that's what I said beforehand. After his political conversion to Christianity as championed by the church at Rome, Clovis defeated the Burgundians, which people at this time were divided between paganism and Christianity. The desire to spread his new religion and to win Christian kingdoms were refu which refused the new doctrines seemed to be the aim of his warlike temper. So what is he doing now? He has a new religion now. He professes to have a new religion, but actually he wants to just support his own uh, place in history, so to speak. And now he wants to, he takes this as a reason to enlarge his kingdom. Can you see it? The barbarity and cruelty of his subsequent acts proved how much his conversion was political and not a surrender to the truth in the heart. The reason why nations subdue themselves to the church Roman Catholic Church is not because they want to be better Christians, because there are their political issues. They want the support of the church. And we see that over and over in history again, especially when we look at the feed here in Daniel 2, or the Ten Kings of the Western Empire. There is no question but that his new profession served the purpose of establishing and enlarging his kingdom. For this reason, he renounced idolatry for the Christianity of the church at Rome. So he wants to establish his own place. That's why he uses the Catholic church. Not because he loves the Catholic church, not because he loves the faith in Christ, but because he wants to have a bigger uh, territory and more influence. Let's continue. The climax of his rise to fame and power was attained when he reached out to take the rich and beautiful lands of southern France from the kingdoms of the Visigoths. So I said the Franks started here in northern France and he got converted and now he's enlarging his territory, he's going south. <clears throat> step by step, Supported by Rome and by the influence of the Emperor of Constantinople, Glovis drove them back until the great and decisive battle in 507 and 508 was waged. So here is an issue raised which I don't necessarily understand yet. But I'll, I'll tell you the issue. If somebody has an input, I would be happy to hear about it after the presentation. We see that Clovis is the first prince, Catholic prince or king in the West. Those are still pagan nations, so to speak. But throughout history, till um, Rome fully established itself in 538, it constantly received support from the East. As we just read, Clovis is being supported by Constantinople, and Constantinople is from the East. As well as um, Justinian, we'll talk about him a bit later, he is from the East, he's the emperor in the East, and he supports how Catholicism is spread in the West. I don't really know yet what to make out of that today because we know that the world is divided into East and West. What does it mean that the East is helping, so to speak, the West or supporting that Catholicism is spread in the West? I'm not sure yet. Anyway, we see here that uh, Clovis step by step gains now new territory under the proclamation that he wants to spread the Catholic or his new faith but in real reason it was that to enlarge his own power and kingdom. It was decisive because neighboring pagan kingdoms that hated him were ready to rush in against him if he lost. Rome watched with anxious heart the outcome of his decisive battle for she well knew that her hopes of expansion in this world were vain, vain if her only prince in the West failed. Can you see now this combination, this, this hate-love relationship? Clovis wants the relationship with the Bishop of Rome, so he has the power, the authority, and the support of the Catholic Church. But what does the Catholic Church want? 
They want Clovis so they can expand their influence and their power and territory. That is the connection between the church and the state, so to speak. Um, <clears throat> Let's continue. The Emperor of Constantinople also, also followed with breathless attention the news of this war. The Emperor, faced by the powerful enemies of the East and North, saw little future for the type of Christianity he was championing if Clovis failed to give the Franks a permanent place under the sun by his final victory. The army of the Visigoths was routed by the Franks in the encounter of 507. It was necessary for Clovis to destroy the sources of further supply. He struck while the iron was hot and in 508 pursued the Visigoths to their southern strongholds and overcame them. Clovis was named the consul by the emperor. Again, by the east, Clovis is being put on the throne. While by the Church of Rome he was called the first Catholic Majesty and his successor the eldest son of the church. So he receives now um, pleasure or pleasing words from the East, the Emperor in the East, as well as the Catholic Church. And he's plucked out the first horn, the Visigoths. The little horn was now, uh, sorry, the Visigoths were not a horn, excuse me. The little horn was now in process of uprooting other horns. How great was the significance of the course of the world's history, the culmination in 508 of the establishment of the first Catholic kingdom in the West. Let witness testify. The Frank king threw his sword into the scale against the Aryan cause. The Aryan cause, I suggest, the Aryans were those who would not subdue to this Rome to the, the religion of Rome. That's why they were called Aryans. Not, it's not, we would have to study the Aryans. Not, it doesn't mean that the Aryans had a correct understanding of the faith. There, was, there were also different varieties, as I said beforehand. However, I want to suggest here that the Aryans are those who protested Rome, and Rome is saying, we need to get rid of these Aryans, and Clovis is helping. Um, where was I? Okay. The Frank king threw his sword into the scale against the Aryan cause and became the champion and hope of the Catholic population all over Gaul. So what happens in 508? Why do we say that paganism was taken away? Because, um, because there's still nine pagan kings. However, um, we can mark here that paganism was taken away because Clovis, from the emperor in the east as well as from the Catholic Roman Church, receives the crown, the authority, and is, it's the first Western, uh, the first nation in the West who is uh, under Catholic, under the Catholic faith now. The pagan dominion was broken, so to speak, and Clovis was going to continue his warfare against the Aryans. So that's why paganism is taken away. The invaders at a length arrived who were to remain. It was decided that the Franks and not the Goths were to direct the future destinies of Gaul and Germany and that the Catholic faith and not Arianism was to be the religion of these great realms. Again from David, Dr. David Hill, former United States ambassador to Germany. Up to the time of Clovis, the invading hordes of the East had moved steadily westwards. Thenceforth, the tide was to be turned backward and conquest was to proceed to the opposite direction. The Franks alone, of all the barbarian races which had invaded the empire, were not wholly absorbed by it, but kept, as it were, an open channel of communication with the great Germanic background. It was the Franks who, turning their faces eastward, not only checked further advances of the barbarians, but were to become the defenders of Christian, Christendom. So we see here there is invasion coming from the east, and Clovis, so to speak, um, he actually s sees it as his goal or his uh, job to stop this invasion. And he's fighting back and says, Essentially, it becomes a, a war between paganism and Christianity. Yet, though, when you look at behind the scenes, Clovis just wanted to enlarge his kingdom and use Christianity for that. Okay, this question, um, this question, Clovis settled not long after the beginning of his career by his conversion to Catholic Christianity in these three ways. Uh, in these three ways, therefore, the work of Clovis was created influence upon the future. He brought together the Roman and the German upon equal terms. 
each preserving the sources of his strength to form a new civilization. He found a po political power which was to unite nearly all the continent itself and to bring the period of the invasion to an end. So Clovis does three things. What were these things? three things? Again, he brought together the Roman and the German upon equal terms, each preserving the sources of his strength to form a new civilization. He's creating a new nation. He, he found a political power which was to unite nearly all the continent itself. So he's trying to have a universal kingdom, doesn't he? And what does he do? And to bring the period of the invasions to an end. One question. The invasions, what would they bring? They bring war, right? What if you calm down those invasions? Is there still war? No, right? Clovis wanted these invasions to stop. He wanted peace again. Have you ever heard the phrase when you asked uh, famous people, oh, what do you wish? And they said, oh, world peace. Now you know where it's coming from. Clovis also wants world peace. But what does it mean to have world peace? It means to have created a new global um, kingdom under the dominion of one ruler. And what is this ruler doing in order to establish their own kingdom? They go to Rome for their support. So when somebody says they're seeking for world peace, this is actually what it means when you look in history. It doesn't mean something good. Thus it was Clovis, the king of the Franks, who in 508 put an end to the prospect that paganism might eventually be supreme. Paganism is taken away. He, Clovis, had on all occasions shown himself the heartless ruffian, the greedy conqueror, the bloodthirsty tyrant, but by his conversion he had led the way to the triumph of, the, of Catholicism. He had saved the Roman church from the Cilia and the Charbis, Char Bis, sorry, <laughs> Charlie Bis of heresy and paganism. Through Clovis, a new area began. A new area. That's also in the verge, we are on the verge of this. Pardon me? New era? Thank you. Thank you. But all the changed, changes, it was that the, but after all the changes, it was the Franks who constantly grew strong, who built up a law a church and an empire. So I suggest when we go through this history of those ten nations up to our time, you will always find a law, a church and an empire. That was always the slogan of various kings which today are considered as great men, but when you look at their history and prophetically, they always wanted to create one big empire under the Catholic faith and under their own dominion, under their law. And I suggest that today we are facing the same again. Because we are seeing a nation which once was very beautiful, but it right now is in a place where it says it wants to make itself great again. This is exactly when you look back in history, how all these emperors started to rise up. They wanted to make their nation great again. And when you think about it in a natural way, there's nothing bad about making your own nation great again. The question is, what is the result thereof? What are the costs for that? <clears throat> um, let's continue, and time is flying by. Uh, probably we're going to finish uh, Clovis and how the papal uh, church was put on the throne today, and then tomorrow we'll go into those various history I was talking about uh, of various kings and see how they were put on the throne of this earth and had, wear the crown of, the pap uh, of Western Rome. <clears throat> let's continue. Um, but after all the changes, it was the Franks who constantly grew strong, who built up a law, a church, and an empire. The baptism of Clovis, which implied the general conversion of the Franks to Christiani Christianity, set the crown of a s on a century of striking success for the Western Church. Western Church is the Bishop of Rome. Next, next uh, section. Um, 30 years after the victory of 508, the papacy was elevated to universal supremacy by Justinian. So Justinian, he's the emperor in the east. So here's the problem again where I can't make something out of it yet. You see again, support from the east to the west. 
Thirty years after the victory, oh, can we read that? The victory of Clovis over the Visigoths in 508, which broke the centuries of pagan dominion, did not necessarily eradicate, eradicate, eradicate thank you, paganism scattered elsewhere. Thirty years later, 538, dominion passed to the papacy, a theocracy which persecuted more severely than the paganism. It is generally recognized that a union of church and state is more intolerant than a political state. I thought this was really powerful. It's better to have just a political state. It's, it, it's not so likely to persecute as, as a union of church and state. And we're about, we're in this test. We're seeing how church and state are coming together again. And this is the, the preparation work from 508 to 538. This is the time period we're in. Um, fired, by the <clears throat> fired by the victory of Clovis, um, the ecclesiastical power of Rome was stirring everywhere. Uh, what is the ecclesiastical power? The That's the church. But how did the church do that? By sending their preachers, right? Doesn't have the Roman church a really vast network of their bishops and their preachers, their monks, which were going everywhere? This is how the Catholic church is spreading their influence and their power, their doctrines. Let's put it that way. They're spreading, spreading their message. And by this message they're having, they're gaining, their, um, they're gaining authority or power over the people. Uh, we don't have time in this series, but read... Great Controversy, Chapter 3. Elm White um, explains how the Catholic Church, through their messages, obtains power over the people due to fear. So when the Roman Church uh, spreads its, its uh, messages everywhere, they, they gain the power of the people. And that's exactly then what the civil authority needs. It needs the support of this powerful church. Justinian de determined to make the rule of the Paper. Okay, sorry. Fired by the victory of Clovis, the ecclesiastical power of Rome was stirring everywhere. In northern Africa, they were disturbing the peace of the Christian kingdom of the Vandals. The, the Vandals were Christians, they just didn't subdue to Rome. And in Spain, they were rising against the Visigoths. Everywhere, says Milman, the ecclesiastical ecclesiastics were increasing their power as what? As mediators? Ne nego negotiators of treaties or as agents in the submissions of revolt and crisis. This is how the Catholic Church operates. Cities. Sorry, I don't know what I said. Um, so how does Rome does it? What does Rome today? Do they send mediators when church have problems or when different countries have their problems? Do they send ambassadors or agents to try let's solve the problem? Is that not how they do it? Well, that's how they did it back then as well. So when we think the papacy is actually quite nice today, it's not as it was in the, back in the days, the 1260s, where it was just persecuting people. Well, it was nice back then too, before it had the power. Justinian determined to make the rule of the papacy universal with his dominion. In 532, he issued his famous edict which laid the foundation of the persecution, for the persecutions of the church which maintained the apostolic faith during the 1260 years. The distinction between the important dates of 532, 533 and 538 should now be considered. There were several degrees of Justinian. Uh, let's read them. By an edict which he issued to unite all men in one faith. Isn't that the slogan always from the Catholic Church? We're all one. Isn't that what they said when they were in Germany for the day of reformation? And the civil authorities, they are recognizing that. In um, one faith, whether Jews, Gentiles, or Christians, such as did not in the term of three months embrace and profess the Catholic faith, were declared infamous and as such excluded from all employments, both civil and military, rendered incapable of leaving anything by will, and their estates confiscated. Confisc 
confiscated, whatever real or personal. These were convincing arguments of the truth of the Catholic faith, but many, however, withstood them. And against such as did, the imperial edict was executed with the utmost rigor. Great numbers were driven from their habitations with their wives and children stripped and naked. Others betook themselves to flight, carrying with them what they could conceal for the support and maintenance, but they were plundered for the little they had. And many of them inhumanly massacred by the Catholic peasants or the soldiers who guarded the passes. What is happening here? Persecution breaks out where? in the east. Why? Because Justinian, he wants to create one faith under the Pope of Rome. And he gives a, a time period of three months where everyone would convert to this faith. If not, they were persecuted. And this causes a refugee problem. A lot of people actually left the east to go to the west. Let's continue reading. Um, the emperor prescribed the faith of every man, and that faith consisted of the doctrines of Rome. That's what Rome did from the beginning. As soon as the disciples died, and Rome came up a little bit, they said, when you want to be a Christian, when you want to believe in that, then you have to believe what we say. When you read this book, you will see how Rome did that, how Rome did it from early on. Um, <clears throat> I keep forgetting where I am. <laughs> There was no process. Uh, thank you. There was no protest from the Pope. So the Pope is not protesting the way how Justinian is going to enforce the papal supremacy. The world dominion of paganism, paganism had come to an end, but the dominion more damaging to primitive Christiani Christianity, more blighting to the intellect, had taken its place. What is being said here? It said it's better to be a pagan than to be part of this false religion. The edict of Justinian in 532 extended over the whole empire as far as it stretched. When, however, Northern Africa and Italy were conquered, this edict followed the imperial arms. So what is happening here? So this edict to um, persecute those people who would not convert was first in the east. But as soon as the east was expanding, that edict would go with it. Um, the severe and ruinous application of the decree did not cease when the three months specified in, uh, in it ceased. It set the pace for the 1260-year period brought to view in the prophet of Daniel. By the decree of 532, Justinian reduced, reduced all true sincere believers to the direst condition, but the decree of 533 exalted the papacy to the highest earthly position possible. So 532 is the degree that everyone has to believe in Catholicism or obey to the Bishop of Rome. 533 is the degree where the papacy is put in the highest position on earth. This exaltation, however, was in decree only until success in war put it into effect. So this decree already exists, but you need the war to put it in effect. Uh, who do you use when you have war? Soldiers, right? And who commands the soldier? The king, right? So the king is a civil authority. So we see here the pope is put as the leader of the world, so to speak, uh, in a spiritual aspect, and the civil authority will put, enforce it. And why will they enforce it? What, why did Clovis do all of this? Because he observed, what did it say? He observed the power and the influence of the papacy. The papacy right now is not doing anything bad. It's not saying persecute those people. What is the papacy right now doing? It's making sure that its influence and power is going all over the world. So, and this is when Pope Francis here, or the Times Magazine says, the new Roman Empire, the global reach of Pope Francis, I'm so sorry that you don't have the picture in your notes. This is what Pope Francis does right now. He travels the world and makes sure that the papal influence goes everywhere. And as soon as he can, he will make sure that he uses civil authority to enforce his influence. And the, the, the civil authorities, they need that that um, influence of the papal church all over the world in order to establish their own. Uh, my time is almost up. Let's, let's just finish reading that section. 
it therefore at first could only could apply only to his own territory. So there was the own territory of Justinian, the East. On the other hand, both decrees applied in Europe when in 538 the Ostrogoths in Italy were crushed and more power was given to the papacy. So um, it's first in the own ter territory of the East, that's uh, Justinian, but it expands. Um, let's continue. Justinian wrote to the people in 533, we have made no delay in subjecting and uniting to your holiness all the priests of the whole earth. In the same letter he also, in the east, sorry, thank you that you're paying attention. <laughs> in the same letter he also said, we cannot suffer that anything which releases to the state of the church, however manifest and unquestionable, should be moved without the knowledge of your holiness, who are the head of all the holy churches. Um, let me see, we should stop here because of the time and we'll pick it up there because uh, we saw now how paganism was taken away, 508. We see the methods of the Catholic Church first internally uh, among the Christians and then how it started to use the civil authorities. We looked a little bit at Clovis, we're going to talk a little bit more about Clovis tomorrow. And from that on, we look at 538, what happened there with the Ostrogoths, which, by the way, were also Christians, but just not the Christianity of Rome. And then we look at various kings throughout history who actually took on this crown of Rome till up today in our time period. I hope you had a pleasant study. Let's kneel down for prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for this day and also for the physical rain. But Lord... We know that this is an optional lesson for the spiritual reign, and this has been a very blessed camp meeting, Lord, and we thank you for the latter rain you have been poured out, have been pouring out here. Lord, as we consider history, we ask you that you open our minds that we can see the patterns and the repetitions in our day and age today. Lord, we are facing a storm, and we all are too weak, but we know that when we're united with Christ, nobody can be against us. Lord, help us that we make sure that we are united with your Son every day, every hour, and that we might be conquerors through him. As we break now, we ask you for refreshing, that we can come back here again and study, continue studying your word. In Jesus' name we thank you. Amen.